Hello YouTube, it's Barbara Jean. Now, I'm going to try and make a stab at some of my personal testimony. Um, it's so much easier when I'm just sitting in my chair or lying down. I can come up with all kinds of things I want to say. And then when it comes to actually staring at myself in front of this camera, it gets a lot more difficult. But um, I'm going to start with a very difficult thing, which is I want to talk about my mother. Um, and the reason I want to talk about my mother is that uh, our relationship was, it was, hmm, where do I go? Um, it wasn't, it wasn't always a great relationship, let's put it that way. But God in his mercy restored my mother and I, um, and gave us a very good relationship. We had, my mother just passed recently, as um, those who are aware watch my videos in the last few weeks um, my mother just passed in this last November and it was it was very um, heartbreaking I was very um, I was overwhelmed by her passing um, but at the same time not um, she had not been well for the last few years but um, particularly in the last year uh, her health really started to decline and it was very hard for me to take, although I was, um, I tried to be as helpful as possible. I mean, I spent a lot of my time between two elderly relatives, a cousin and my mother, basically, you know, helping them with their their needs and their grocery shopping and getting them to where they needed to go and their, their doctor's offices. And um, I was very blessed in that because it allowed me to spend a great deal of time with my mother. But the reason I'm bringing her up right now, as difficult as it is, is I have to talk about the spiritual implications that the Lord showed me after her passing, which I hadn't really, uh, I hadn't really thought of until after she passed. And the Lord showed me this the prophetic implications of my mother and our relationship. Um, first, I want to read a couple of Bible verses. First, um, um, let's see, Deuteronomy Deuteronomy five sixteen. Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, and that they may that it may go well with thee, in the land which the Lord God giveth thee. So honoring your father and mother is a um, is the um, first law in the Ten Commandments. This is the fifth law, that but it's the the first one that has a promise to it. In fact, I think it's the only one that has a promise that's attached. So if you honor your father and mother, your days your days will be prolonged and it may go well with thee. So honoring your father and mother must be pretty important. Not just your father, not just your mother, both your father and your mother. Let's uh, go to Matthew 15, 1. Then came, uh, then came Jesus, then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, why do the disciples transgress the laws of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat. But he answered them and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandments of God by your traditions? For God commanded, saying, Honor your, thy father and mother. And he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But as you say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mayest be profited by me. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandments of God of none effect by your traditions. Ye hypocrites, you did Isaiah's prophecies of well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Shall I do that I may have eternal life? So, basically, uh, what, what shall? Oh, sorry, that what shall I do to have that? Not that's not there. That was actually a mistake. Um, so the last verse was uh, fifteen nine. Uh, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. That was Matthew fifteen nine or one, Matthew fifteen one through through nine, Matthew nineteen, starting at verse seventeen. And he said unto them, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. 
If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he saith unto him, Which, which, so this is the rich young ruler. He's asking a question. question. It says, Which commandments? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not fare false, fare, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love the Lord. Thou shalt, excuse me, my eyesight is not working so well today, today nor is my tongue. <laughs> thou shalt honor thy father and mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay. Um, this is Mark 7, uh, Mark 7. Oh, this looks like okay. Um, verse nine, verse nine through thirteen, and he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandments of God, that ye may be your, may keep your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor thy father and mother, and whosoever curses father or mother, let him die the death. But if you say, If a man shall say to his father and mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift. By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free, and ye shall and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother. So basically, what these people were doing was, in the way they were supposed to look after their father and mother, um, you know, by giving them, um, you know, but basically taking care of their needs when they especially got one became elderly. The um, the Pharisees and the scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites would say, well, this gift that, that I would normally give to you, it's going to go to God, or it's, it's, it's Korban, which Korban means, let me see if I can find the specific wording for this. Um, let's see, it's Mark, Mark 7. I'm sorry, I'm rambling. Like I said, this is not easy. It's never easy for me to do this. Uh, Corban. It's the word an offering consecrated to the temple. So they would take their the money that or the gifts or the food or whatever it was that they were supposed to give to their parents and, and give it to the temple rather than look after their own people. And so Jesus was rep reprimanding them for not looking after their parents or looking after the needs of their parents. Um, so verse, verse 12, And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father and mother, making the word of God none effect through your traditions. Ye have delivered and made such like things do ye. So Jesus was not too happy with them for um, changing the commandments of look, honoring your father and mother and, and making it a religious sacrifice to look good for the everybody else but not look after their own people so basically it was we're taking what belongs to you and what we to honor you and to help you and take care of you we're going to give it to our religious organization and uh, therefore we'll be honored by men <laughs> um and your and the parents were supposed to be happy and satisfied with that because it was given to the church um in some ways, that's what's happening today, too. I mean, people are, we're commanded to look after our parents. I mean, it's a New Testament commandment. Obviously, Jesus spoke it, so it must have been important. And instead of looking after our parents or looking after those people, we should be looking after our children or we have make a big show of giving all this money to religious organizations or political organizations. And so what, what should have gone to our parents or to help them in their needs, in their time of needs, uh, we rather have the big show and the lot and applaud of men in religious organizations, religious traditions. So, I don't 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 tell me this is not happening again in our time. It definitely is happening. Um, okay. I think that's all I want to sit, read for the moment. Um, yeah. Okay. My mother. It's already gone like 10 minutes. Um, mother and I had a very... I'm going to try and make it short, but it's not going to be easy to do. 
Um, my, I love my mother. In fact, I loved her, always loved her, but I didn't always respect her or, or even like her. And the same could be <laughs> said about her, her relationship with me. She, she loved me. I knew she loved me, but she didn't always like me. And I can't always say I was particularly likable. <laughs> I had a lot of growing up to do, and so anyway, my mother and I had a very um, tumultuous relationship for the most part, for many, many years, let's put it that way, for many, many years. Um, the real, uh, I was obedient, uh, an obedient child, but when uh, age of 14, when the Lord, when I had this experience, which I've explained in another book, but I won't go through right now. And I had this experience with the Lord, and He placed this thorn of, thorn of suffering in my heart. That's when all of a sudden my relationship with my mother became particularly tumultuous. Um, it was rather t relatively peaceful between my mother and, all, and I, as long as I just did what I was told. But after this experience, suddenly I, it became imperative for me to be able to communicate with my mother. I wasn't no longer satisfied with having a relationship that just required me listening and doing and her. And, and not no communication. I needed to be able to communicate my feelings to my mother. And well, my mother wasn't too happy with that. My mother wasn't perfect. I loved her dearly. And uh, she wasn't perfect. And neither was I. And so the two of us had to we basically went into this battle mode um, for most of our relationship into well into my 40s. There, uh, there, was, uh, there was a battle, ongoing battle between us. Um, I pursued my mother. I wouldn't let her let the relationship slide into mediocrity uh, or a pretense. I was always trying to confront her with my feelings and what was uh, what was going through, and and I wasn't really asking her for permission. I was basically asking her for for understanding, just to, or acceptance, basically just acceptance. Um, and like I said, I was I wasn't a perfect daughter in any way. I wasn't perfect in any way, way whatsoever. I had a lot of problems. My mother was a very sort of assertive person. She was a person that had an, something in her head. She would just go and do it. It wasn't. Um, there was very few barriers in her life when it came to um, when it came to if she needed to do something. She didn't think twice about it. She just put it put her foot to the metal and away she went. And she didn't understand my personality, which was quite different. I was more like my father, um, a dreamer, um, 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 insecure, fearful. Uh, um, my mother wasn't a fearful kind of person. She never seemed to exude fear. And in, in a way, I always felt that the world was safe. when Because my mother was here, I felt safe. Not so much my father, because my father and I, although I love my dad very much, he left very early in my, um, well, she, he left when I was around 12 years old. He, he left the family. And, um, but that's another story, and I've gone through that in another video. Um, but anyway, um, but my mother and I, God, it seemed important to the Lord that I pursued my mother. So I did. And uh, no matter what happened, it seemed like I, I would leave. I would be on my own for a little while, and then I'd be thrown back into my mother's home. And the two of us were constantly thrown back together. I was the only un unmarried daughter of my mother's fa uh, children. And so, therefore, <laughs> I really didn't have any support system uh, other than my mother. So what happened whenever I'd, it happened quite often, I would fall, it would, I'd be on my own, then I'd come back to my mother. I was constantly in my mother's care. Um, and this frustrated her, it frustrated me. But I think it was the Lord's way of making sure that we constantly were in contact with each other and we straightened out the issues between us. So in a way, it seemed like a curse, but it was actually a blessing. Um, I had a very dramatic experience in my 30s, which I'm not going to go into in this video. Um, I already, ex I, I think one way, way back then, I uh, in my early testimony uh, videos, I explained this situation between my mother and I. Uh, and God revealed a, a, a memory that involved my mother, but not directly. Um, and it happened when I was a little baby, a tiny, tiny baby. Um, 
and as a result it it had an impression on me that left uh, left a, a, a very strange impression on me and and as a result I ended up with migraine headaches I had migraine headaches all the way from childhood into uh, my 30s when the Lord revealed this uh, but I had gone to a faith a faith meeting a faith healing meeting at the airport church in Toronto um, because I wanted to be healed from these migraine headaches that I've had all my life and as a result the Lord gave me a memory now the memory set free in my mind something between my mother and I basically it it opened the door of understanding between us because suddenly I was able to see my mother as a human being rather than um, a uh, an evil entity in my life <laughs> you know constantly there you know irritating is stirring up the pot um, I loved her dearly but I always felt sometimes that she was there to stir up the pot and, and you know my mother in a lot of ways she directed my life in so many ways I would if it wasn't for my mother I never would have gone into show business because she was the one who pushed me and like I said there was never a thing that my mother said my mother said if she wanted to do something she would do it she I mean she helped me to to step out of my comfort zones basically and it was very difficult for me to do but she was the one who pushed me she said you're gonna do this I've signed you up you're gonna do this you're gonna sign she signed me up without even asking me she would just do it because she knew I wouldn't and um, but anyway uh, this incident what had happened in my in my 30s that opened up my mind to understanding my mother better and it helped me to see something about myself it helped me to see um, sometimes that we hold um, issues inside deep 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 inside of us and they can be they can go be, be so far back or seem or even in small incidental inc incidences that can affect our whole entire life that traumatize us and we they they affect the way we see things and it was because of this incident that the Holy Spirit spoke to me because I had just thought I had just lost my mother forever forever I mean in a way I felt like somehow I'd lost my mother through this supernatural experience which by the way actually healed my it did heal my, the migraine headaches after the Lord revealed this to me I would gone to the healing faith healer um, faith he um, this airport church in Toronto and they prayed over me the, this memory came back and the migraine headaches went I never had those awful migraine headaches again praise the Lord so anyway but because of this um, memory um, I felt quite lost I felt alone I felt abandoned I felt betrayed uh, by my mother and that's when the Holy Spirit spoke to me very clearly because I felt like a motherless child just like that song you know sometimes I feel like a motherless child well I felt like a motherless child and the Holy Spirit spoke to me very clearly and said let me be your mother which shocked me it shocked me to think of God as a feminine entity that there was a feminine feminine side to the Lord because um, we told all my life that God is all male. That God is the Father is male. The God, the Holy Spirit is male. God, the Holy, the Son is male. Therefore, God is completely male. And to see God as my mother, suddenly there was this feminine identity that I didn't have before, and it shocked me. And I thought about it for a while, and I thought, well, I do need a mother. And God said He would be all that I could be. He He would be everything to me, so why not my mother? And it was then that the Lord began to open my mind and help me to see that God has a feminine identity. There is a feminine identity in the Godhead, which is the Holy Spirit. Now I didn't understand how or why because of all the so-called verses that said the Holy Spirit is He, which, by the way, they are misinterpreted because when you go back and you go into the Greek you find that the, the pronouns that are actually the, the he pronouns that are um, describing the comforter or the Holy Spirit are actually neutral or mystery. They're a mystery pronoun. They are not, they're, they're, the he is not there. It's either he, she, or it, or neutral. There is a mystery to the pronoun. And I think that the 
Oh, this is going off topic for a moment, but the um, um, interpreters of the Bible either because of their <laughs> uh, blindness, brainwashing, um, hubris, male ego, <laughs> either deliberately or unknowingly interpreted those pronouns that describe the Holy Spirit in the way they did for either they were they they were deliberately um, misled or just deliberately blinded sometimes God allows blindness to happen to us because it's not time to reveal a thing um, the, the Holy Spirit is a mystery well guess who's also called mystery women are called mysteries <laughs> men don't understand women well they don't understand the Holy Spirit either because she is a mystery and the mystery is now being revealed anyway I'm got, I've got off top, topic here for a second I'm talking about my mother this is going to be a very long video I could just see it now Oh, this is not easy. Um, but anyway, so when the Holy Spirit told me to think of her as my mother, it was a shock to my system. It was shocking. But as a result, I said, okay. <laughs> I said, okay. This was back in, uh, I think it was back in the 90s, mid-90s this happened, 19, 1995, 96, somewhere in there. Um and I said, okay, all right, I can accept this. I can receive this. I don't understand it, but I'll receive it. Um, and as a result, something opened up in my head. There was a new understanding, a new revelation that was going on that I was learning to explore. Um, sometimes the Lord just expects us to have a, an open mind about certain things. That, like I said just in my other videos, just because you've been told something your whole life doesn't mean it's true. And and so I I said okay I can I can receive this, <laughs> I can receive this. I need a mother right now. I feel lonely and lost, because like I said before, I always felt safe. If my mother in the world, I always felt that I was safe because my mother was here. The strength my mother had was something that I did not possess. So, being an insecure and shy kind of person, it was. Um, really hard for me to be without a mother. I need my mother, especially being an unmarried woman. So I said yes to the Lord, okay, be my mother. Holy Spirit, be my mother. And as a result, um, interesting things started happening. These older women started coming into my life, and they mothered me. <laughs> um, the churches that I, church, I attended, a couple of churches, but one particular church, the women just surrounded me. They were just always mothering me. You know, they were they're so kind and gentle and they were always concerned about me and they were they were just always around me. They just kind of built me up and, and helped me get through the things that I had to go through. They were just they were my mothers. And it was they were there was the Holy Spirit was leading them into my life and helping me to support me while my mother and I were going through this tumultuous time. Um, an interesting thing happened, though. I ended up back in my mother's house. And um, my mother and I were not communicating very well. Uh, but little by little, I had what, what changed in my life with my mother was that I had to learn how to speak to her. I didn't have an honor for my mother that I should have. I didn't honor her. I didn't respect her. I didn't... I didn't see, I didn't, um, I wasn't forgiving or acceptable of her humanity. But as I, this time was different, because when I was thrown back into my mother's home, I, I consciously had to learn how to speak to my mother so that she could hear what I was saying to her and not be offended by what I was saying. And it was hard. <laughs> I can tell you it was difficult. But I, I pursued. Um, she started, to, she started to, it, this time she began to hear what I was saying, but she didn't understand me. I could see that she didn't understand what I was going through or what I was trying to communicate with her. 
Um, but I still pursued. I still pursued the communication with her. And I could see she was saying, <laughs> she could this look on her face. It would be so precious. This look on her face, I'd say, you know, I love you, but I think you're crazy. <laughs> you poor deluded child. You know, I love you, but you're completely out of your mind. <laughs> I'll never forget it. Oh my goodness, I'll never forget. But I, I didn't, I didn't deter me. It didn't stop me from still telling her. But I, like I said, I had to learn, and it took several years to perfect it. The this communication, and she started. Well, she opened up to me in a lot of ways, and and I really, we began to really enjoy each other. I began to find the humor in her. I began to see. Uh, even even laugh at her, not laugh at, but laugh with her about her and help her to laugh too about her idiosyncrasies and she would laugh about mine and we would be able to laugh together about different things that were funny things about us and 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 I was able to communicate different things to her that I never would have been able to, but I had to learn how to do it. It was a struggle, but in the end it was worth it because at the end, and this is the point I really wanted to get to, was in the end, there was an agreement that came between us. Um, you remember back uh, a couple of months ago, three, four, several months ago now, actually, I think it was the beginning of September, I had that incredible experience where I was actually had a cousin, I was taking a cousin to the hospital, and I, on the roof of St. John's Hospital, a black dove flew across my path. I made a video about it. But I was actually, before that, I was actually, the funny thing was that a couple of weeks before that, or a week before that, I was doing videos on the sign of Jonah, which happened to be the dove. And then to see a week later, a black dove fly across my path on the roof of St. Paul's Hospital, and the very next day to see a white dove, which I had never seen before, um, in the park that was where I was walking my dog, and I even took pictures of it, that's on my video, um, I had said on my video that the Holy Spirit, that the bride and the Holy Spirit have to come into agreement. And the reason why I say that is in the book of Revelation, I know it seems like I'm jumping around here, uh, Revelation chapter 22, it says, verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Um, well, here it says the Holy Spirit and the bride say, come. The two of them are put together, the Holy Spirit and the bride. They are the ones who come into agreement with each other. The Holy Spirit, mother, the, our Holy Spirit, our comforter, our mother, who births us in our, the, the new birth and baptism. If you're born of the water and of the Spirit, you shall, you know, that's that, that's the new birth. Uh, that's how we get into the kingdom, okay? When you're born again through the Holy Spirit. Anyway, it says here in verse, 20, uh, verse 17 of Revelation 22, the Spirit and the bride say, come. And in those videos, it wasn't the first time I said it, but however, I said that the Holy Spirit and the bride have to come into agreement. They have to come into agreement. And anyway, the reason why I'm bringing this up was this happened a few weeks before before my mother's death. I knew my mother was dying. It was it was very traumatic. It was very hard for me to face. I didn't want to face my mother's death. It was very hard. But the Lord was showing me something. Because after she died, uh, the Lord showed me this prophetic meaning of all this. When my mother, uh, before she died, a year before she died, some interesting things were happening with my mother. I mean, there were before I would talk to my mother, and my mother would look at, look at me like I was nuts. Um, I love you, but you're crazy. Something was extraordinarily was happening. I didn't even wasn't even fully aware of it. My mother and I were coming into agreement. I would say something to my mother, and my mother would go, "Yeah, that makes sense. Yes." And she was no longer looking at me like I was a crazy lunatic. But she was actually saying, I agree with you. That makes sense. And that was the first time she ever said that to me. Before it was like, I love you, but you're nuts. But now she was looking at me, yes, yes, I understand. That makes sense to me. Yes, I, I agree. 
suddenly it was like we were there was this understanding that we didn't have before was suddenly there and I didn't even occur to me like I said until after she passed and I was looking back at all of this and we're going my mother and I came to an agreement my mother and I were in agreement with each other I understood her I understood her position I understood I, I, I had empathy and understanding and and for her and compassion and I loved her and she loved me and but she also understood me and she was understanding my position she was understanding what I was trying to say to her and there was an agreement that came between us that was extraordinary <laughs> That had never happened before. This That whole year that my mother was really getting sick, she was going, yeah, I agree. I understand what you're saying to me. I know what you're trying to say now. There was a look in her eyes that was completely different, and she would say out loud, I agree. That was extraordinary. The Lord was showing me the prophetic implications through my mother's illness and through this last year that the Holy Spirit and the bride have to come into agreement with each other. They have to understand one another. What does this mean in, in the spiritual man? What does this mean by for the bride of Christ? It means that when the Holy Spirit infills the church, the fullness of the church, when the, the, the bride of Christ comes into agreement with the Holy Spirit, it means that there's an understanding. There was a distance between them because the church, the bride, was not in agreement with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was trying to compel the bride to do what was right. And the bride was saying, well, understand me first. Understand me. Understand me. Not honoring the Holy Spirit. Not honoring the, the, the things that the Holy Spirit was commanding it to do. The church, the bride, was in rebellion to the Holy Spirit. But there were a few pockets of, of Christians out there who were still um, in agreement with the Holy Spirit, but the majority of the church, the majority of the bride, didn't have any understanding or, or, or honoring of the Holy Spirit. They completely ignored the Holy Spirit as though the Holy Spirit was some kind of little mystery out there. Well, you know, we get into all with the Holy Spirit, blah, 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 and then go about their business and not even really think about it. Honoring the Father, honoring the Son, but ignoring the Holy Spirit. Not understanding, not having appreciation for, and not obeying the Holy Spirit, not living with the Holy Spirit, not having a viable relationship with the Holy Spirit. There was a contention between the, the bride and the Holy Spirit. But at the end, the Holy, as the bride gets more full of the Holy Spirit, filled up with the knowledge and the truth and the wisdom that's encased in the Bible, the Word of God, and comes into agreement that every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is the truth. And there is no need to transfor transform it and to change it and to do this, do that, and everything in order to make it more palatable for their congregations. But to receive it as it says. That's an agreement. <laughs> you, We become an acceptable bride. We become an acceptable bride for Christ when we come into agreement with the Holy Spirit. Because if you're in contention with the Holy Spirit, you are not an acceptable bride. If you refuse to do what the Holy Spirit says to do, if you refuse to be born again of the water and of the Spirit, you are not an acceptable bride. An acceptable bride has faith in her husband, has faith in his words, has faith in what he says for us to do. We don't have to try and change anything in order to make us, um, uh, to make us palatable to the world, to, to, to man. We're trying to make ourselves palatable and, and acceptable for our husband. We're not married to the world. We're not married to the political systems. We're married to Jesus Christ. Therefore, we're trying to make ourselves acceptable for the Son of God. And that is in agreement with the Holy Spirit. When we can say that this word, the, the Bible, is the truth, and we do our best to follow it, 
and not train, try to change the tra- things into the traditions of man. Well, we don't have to take Lord's Supper or, because our church says we only need to take it once a year or we don't need to take it at all. That's a tradition. That's not what the Bible says. It says whenever you get together, remember the Lord's death. Oh, baptism. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But, but we changed that. We don't really need baptism. Didn't really mean water baptism. Oh, yes, Jesus did it. He was the firstborn. And he showed us how it, what it meant to be born again. But we don't need to do it. Because our church says, our elders say, we don't need that to be, be, to be saved. We can just speak the word and we're saved and we're born again. Hello, hello we're born again. Even though, of course, the Bible doesn't really say that. But we don't need Christ. That is not an acceptable bride. Because you're not in agreement with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that he's, he wants his bride to be without spot or wrinkle. What? That is lies and deceptions. Traditions of men and lies of Satan that have twisted the truth so it's not truth at all. Okay, or there's partial truth, only some truth. The bride comes into agreement with the Holy Spirit. Why? Why is this important? Because Jesus is going to establish his own house, his own kingdom, his own household. And he wants a bride that is without spot or wrinkle, who has learned to trust her husband in every point. He's going to leave and he's going to cling to his wife. Now, I wanted to bring one other thing up before I finish this video. Is that before my mother passed, um, I was finding, I knew my mother was getting sicker and sicker and I was getting harder and harder for me to to visit her in the hospital. It was just, it was at the point where I I couldn't even go. I was so upset and so, um, so, I couldn't deal with it. I just couldn't deal with it. And so uh, the last month and a half of her life, I, I, I couldn't go. I couldn't go to the hospital. And um, although I did visit her a couple of times, it was really, really hard for me to see. Because, I, like I said, I always felt safe. If my mother was in the world, I was safe. And it's the same for the bride of Christ. We feel safe. With the Holy Spirit is here with us, we feel safe. She gives us courage. She gives us strength. She gives us comfort. So for her to to leave this world, imagine how horrible that would be. The Holy Spirit suddenly to leave. But the Lord was showing me something because um, a couple of weeks before she passed, I had this emergency emergency hernia operation. Now, what has this got to do with anything? It actually gave me the courage to let her go. I'm going to tell you why. Um, I was I was in tremendous pain. And suddenly this this pain happened, and I think, why do things happen the way they do and when they do? This I had this emergency hernia operation. Um, I a week before I had the operation, I had this ter- terrible rip in my in my side. I felt some, I knew something was ripped, and a week later I had this surgery. It was a belly button hernia. Thank God it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a bowel hernia because that a strangulated hernia, that would have been very, very, very dangerous. This was dangerous enough as it was, but thank God it was a. It was a navel hernia. <laughs> as a result of this hernia, they had to cut the navel. They had to cut the belly button, the muscle that holds the belly button, and in order to repair the hernia. Significance. What was the significance of that? Well, cutting the apron strings, cutting the um, cutting the umbilical cord that attaches you to your mother. That's the spiritual implication. When they cut the umbil- this umbilical cord in my stomach and they repaired the damage, Um, and while I was well enough to get on my feet and go see my mother in the hospital, this was the last time I saw her alive, I felt there was, 
It was almost a joy. It was hard to explain it. It was a peace inside of me and a joy to see her. But I was able, in fact, I said to her, I was very deliberate, and I said to her, Mom, and I had a smile on my face, and I said, Mom, we've been very selfish. You're tired, and you want to go home. But I'm letting you go. So I said to her, I said, I'm letting you go. We'll be okay. I'm letting you go. I love you. You go home. A couple of days, they, a couple of days later, my mother died. There was a look of relief on her face when I said it. I could see that something inside of her said, "Okay, I don't have to be afraid for my children. I don't have to be afraid for my daughter. She's going to be okay." I don't, it was just, it was a God thing. It was a God thing. God cut the apron strings between my mother and I. And I thought about it later after she passed. And I realized the spiritual implication was the bride has to be able to let go of her father and mother and cling to her husband when she is full of the Holy Spirit. When she has come to her fullness and maturity, she has to let go of the father and the mother and cling to her husband. I will read this right now. Matthew 19.3 The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for, for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which is made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. Therefore, Wherefore there are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Also, Ephesians 5.29 For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the Church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the Church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love him, his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. The Lord was showing me, not only does the Lord Jesus have to leave his father and mother in order to cleave to his wife, the wife has to leave her father and mother too in order to cleave to her husband, in order to establish their own home, their own kingdom, their own household. Jesus will have his own household. Let me see if I can find, I actually... I think I put it here. Did I? Um, oh, maybe I didn't. Oh, I thought I did. Sorry, I thought I had put this verse here. Anyway, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about Jesus establishing his own home, his own kingdom, his own household. We are his household. We are the ones he clings to. We are the ones full of the Holy Spirit. He will leave, in a sense, his father and mother, although, of course, Jesus will always be part of God, and that's not the, that's not the point. But the point is the Father and the, and, the, and the Holy Spirit have their own household, and Jesus will leave his father and mother in order to cleave to his bride and establish his own household. That's important to know. He will establish his own household, and he must have a bride that is worthy of, of him, a bride without spot or wrinkle, who are, is clinging to him as he is clinging to her. They will be twain. They will be one flesh. No more twain, but one flesh. They will be united. They will be married. 
And that is what he's he's looking for in his in his church and his bride. And goes going through this experience with my mother made me realize how very important that is. There will be a point where the church will have to let go of the Holy Spirit because the fullness of the Holy Spirit will be in us. But we will no longer cling to the Holy Spirit. We will no longer feel safe because of the Holy Spirit. We will feel safe because of our husband, Jesus Christ. See, right now we're clinging to the Holy Spirit. But one day the Lord will cut that apron string between the Holy Spirit and the church, the bride, that comes into agreement and cut that apron string. And that the, the, the Jesus will leave his father and mother and we will leave the father and mother too. And we will cling to our husband in order to establish a new household. Anyway, again, pers part of my personal testimony and a prophetic word that the apron string has been cut. We are now we, we are now on our own, basically. The Holy Spirit will leave, but we will not be there or uh, comfort us because we have a husband. You see, we have to come into agreement with the Holy Spirit in order to be an acceptable bride. We have to learn how to trust His Word. See, the Holy Spirit teaches us all things, but the Holy Spirit was no, not doing anything more than showing us the Word. Showing us how to trust the Word, how to trust Jesus, who is our husband. He is the Word. See, we don't have to make excuses or uh, come up with new ideas or transform the, the Word into something else in order to make it more acceptable. Because our word, our husband is acceptable. His word is acceptable. We're not ashamed of his gospel. We're not ashamed of his word. We're not ashamed of who he is. We love our husband with all our hearts. We respect him. We've learned to respect the Father. We've learned to respect the Holy Spirit. We are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. It's time to say goodbye. Like of our own old household or old ideas or old ways. The Father and the Holy Spirit, we are now part of a new household. We are now clinging to our husband, Jesus Christ. He is our husband. Oh, let me just before I, I sign off, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this. Um, uh, years ago, um, back when I was in my I think late teens or early twenties, I don't remember exactly. But I was really struggling with the, the loss of my father. My father, he didn't die, but he he left the family. He he left my mother. And I was really struggling. I, I struggled with it because I loved my dad so very much, and and it was very very hard for me. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know how I was going to be able to handle not having a father. Um. And it was when the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, "You can always talk to the Father." And it was the way the Holy Spirit spoke to me about it. Suddenly, it's something inside my head. It was the same experience that I had when the Lord said, "Let me." The Holy Spirit said, let me be your mother, only 20 years later, or less than 20 years, 15, 16 years later. Um, it was the same kind of experience. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you could always talk to the Father. And I went, yeah, you're right. I, I'm not a fatherless child. I do have a father. God, I could talk to God. I could talk to the Father. And that's when I began to, um, I began to um, visualize using my imagination. I, usually when I went to bed at night, I'd put my head on the pillow, I'd close my eyes, and I would concentrate, and I would visualize walking into the, king, into the kingdom and walking up to the throne room of God and sitting down next to the Father and clinging to Him. Not not, uh, not at um, on the throne, but on his at his feet. I would just put my arms around his legs, and I would just cling to him, and I would tell him all the things that I was feeling, all my thoughts for the day, or different things, and he would speak to me. That was the most beautiful thing. It was like, I wasn't just me talking to him; he would speak to me, and it was a, it was a, it was a very healing thing for me to do, to to see him as my father and to. And sometimes even the anger that I had at my natural father came out on him. But he seemed, he had the shoulders to, to bear. He wasn't offended by my anger or my hurt or my mis misunderstandings. He was always there and he helped me to straighten things out. And he was loving and good and always forgiving and never rejected me. Never, never, never rejected me. No matter what I was feeling or how angry I, I was or whatever was going on. 
He never rejected me. Okay. <laughs> Why am I bringing this up? Was that recently a thing happened uh, um, when I started having this experience with the Lord Jesus, when the, Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus came to me a few years ago, and I was going through all of this, um, I, there was a couple of times when I'd close my eyes and go back to the Father and say, oh, Daddy, I want to stay with you. And he would talk to me and it would be okay. But um, something happened a couple of years ago, which surprised me. And it happened, it keeps happening now. That when I close my eyes and I go back to the Father, I want to. I'm having a tantrum or I'm angry about what's going on in my life, and I'm not too happy with Jesus at the moment <laughs> because I don't understand why He doesn't speak to me about this or that or everything, and why is this all a big mystery? I have my problems, people. There are times when I don't understand what's happening. Oh, let's just say I almost always don't always understand what's happening, but I nonetheless there. So I get frustrated, and so um, I there's been the last couple of times when I've run closed my eyes and run back to the father and, and sat at his feet and clung to his legs and said, I don't understand. I don't want to go back. And uh, the father would say to me, what are you doing here? The first time it happened, it shocked me. Well, the second time it also shocked me. What do you mean, what am I doing here? What do you mean, what am I doing here? I've always done this. And it was like I said, the father would say to me, no, you don't belong here anymore. This is not your place. Your place is not at my feet anymore. Your place is at your side of my of my son. You cling to him. You don't cling to me anymore. You cling to my son. You're his wife. You're his bride. You go to him and cling to him. And I took a couple of times for, for him to say this to me when I finally went, Oh, okay. I get it. I get it, Lord to cling to Jesus. It's time to cut the apron strings. <laughs> it's time to go to the man who's supposed to help me, and that's Jesus, the one I'm supposed to have my faith in, my trust in. So, anyway, I just wanted to, like I said, pers part of my personal testimony, it's out there, you can listen to it or not. I'm sure that if you've gotten to this far, God bless you. <laughs> I hope you got something from it. Um, sometimes it's hard to listen to other people's personal testimony, but Nonetheless, it has to be said because our testimony is how we overcome Satan. We overcome him with the blood, and we overcome him with our testimony. And uh, anyway, this incident, this new incident, this thing that just happened with my mother's death, was rather hard. Um, oh, uh, let me just also mention since it's almost going on an hour here, <laughs> why not make it longer? Um, was that when my mother passed, I, I did feel I had a lot of panic attacks, I have to admit. I had I had several panic attacks, um, but they kept getting lesser and lesser and lesser. As the first time it happened, I, I thought I was having a heart attack, looking for a tissue, my nose was getting a little runny. Um, and the first time, it, I mean, it happened a few, several times I had this panic attack. Um, because, like I said, I always felt safe because my mother was here in this world. And with my mother gone, suddenly the world didn't seem so safe. Um, but as as uh, those last few weeks have gone on, Jesus has really comforted me a great deal with his presence. And the panic attacks, thank God, are, are lessening and lessening and lessening. They're, I can, they're, every now and then I get a little twinge. But they're barely there anymore, which is wonderful because I used to have some major panic attacks. I don't believe me, this is not the first time they've happened. I've had them on different part times in my life when I was going through certain things. Um, different things in my life, I've had panic attacks. But this, this was, uh, this was, uh, you know, like I said, at first they were pretty, they were pretty severe, and then they began to lessen and lessen and lessen. So that I'm not feeling that fearful that awful fear of, oh, my mother's gone, what am I going to do? My mother's not here, what am I going to do? I feel uh, um, my confidence is actually pretty good. Um, I miss her terribly. I miss my mother terribly. I love her. I love her so much. And I'm so thankful that I had the opportunity 
to get so close to my mother and that we finally came into agreement with one another at the end. Like I said, the last year of her life has been a miracle that she's she's looking at me with different eyes and saying, I agree. I understand and I agree. That was that was a blessing to me. A tremendous blessing to me. And this is what we're seeking for in the Holy Spirit is to come into agreement where the two of us, the Holy Spirit and the bride, will be in a full agreement with each other. We will be a worthy bride for our Lord Jesus Christ. Anyway, that's all I need to say right now. God bless. There's still more to come. <laughs> hard stuff. I haven't said the hard stuff yet. Believe me. Talk to you later.